Russia has stepped up its bombardments of Ukraine's capital, Kyiv. A number of strikes have hit a residential neighbourhood. It's unclear if there were any casualties. Local authorities say at least five people were killed yesterday. A 35-hour curfew is now in place. Russia has also launched new assaults on the port city of Mariupol. The United Nations says three million people have now fled Ukraine. In a show of solidarity, three Eastern European leaders visited Kyiv on Tuesday. In Kyiv, as the Russian advance nears, Ukrainian soldiers have taken time to bury the fallen. Here they are laying to rest a comrade who was killed resisting the Russians in Borispil outside Kyiv. As Ukrainians watch the ceremony, they know that there will be many more funerals before the guns fall silent. While little sign of a peaceful solution is in sight, President Zelensky said he saw a glimmer of hope for compromise in talks with Russia, even as Moscow stepped up its bombardment of the capital. It is important. It's difficult, but important, because any war ends in an agreement. Meetings continue. As I'm told, the positions in the negotiations sound more realistic. However, there still needs to be more time for decisions to be in Ukraine's interests. Meanwhile, hailing glory to Ukraine, the Polish, Czech and Slovenian prime ministers became the first foreign leaders to visit Kyiv since Russia's invasion. All three are former communist territories which are now members of the EU and NATO. They reiterated their desire to give Ukraine a way to join the EU as soon as possible. I hope it should be agreed over the next couple of uh, days or weeks and the candidate status should be given till the end of this year at the latest. Thank you. The three-week-old conflict has cranked up Cold War-level tensions between Moscow and the West and driven more than three million Ukrainians fleeing across the border to seek refuge. Zelensky also addressed a key concern used by Vladimir Putin to justify the invasion of Russia's ex-Soviet neighbour by saying Ukraine should accept that it would not become a member of the NATO Defence Alliance. Ukraine is not a member of NATO. We understand that. We've heard for years that the doors were open, but we also heard that we could not join. It's a truth and it must be recognised. There's movement elsewhere in the West. Zelensky said he would address the US Congress later on Wednesday and Joe Biden will visit Europe next week to shore up NATO's unity as war rages on its eastern flank. Well, let's bring in DW correspondent Alexandra von Naaman in Lviv. Alexandra, there's been increased shelling, as we just heard, in and around the capital, Kyiv. What is happening there in the capital? There are reports about heavy fighting on the outskirts of Kyiv, explosions in the city centre. Residential areas were apparently hit by Russian um, airstrikes uh, and the Russian forces um, are trying to tighten their grip on the city. Uh, and that is why the city's mayor announced a curfew that it's going to last for 35 hours. He urged all residents to seek shelter, to take cover. Vitaly Klitschko, however, also publish a statement saying that uh, the city is not going to give in, to give up, uh, that the Russians can take buildings but not the people of Kiev. Alexander, yesterday we saw three Eastern uh, European leaders visit Zelensky in Kiev at huge personal risk. How significant was that visit? Well, taking uh, or given the situation in Kiev, uh, the decision to travel to the Ukrainian capital was a very bold move and a highly uh, symbolic gesture that was praised by the Ukrainian president. He said that uh, having such such friends and partners uh, make sure that Ukraine is going to win the war. However, we also have to stress uh, what they talked about. And in terms of substance, um, they talk about sanctions new sanctions against Russia uh, that is likely to happen. They talked about uh, EU's uh, humanitarian help and EU's assistance to rebuild Ukraine. Uh, that is also likely to happen once we will have peace. However, other topics they were that were on the agenda, uh, the proposal by the Polish Vice Prime Minister Kaczynski to have sort of peacekeeping force on the ground in Ukraine with NATO forces supporting this mission is, is not very likely to happen any time. 
Now, you're in Lviv in the west of Ukraine. Are people there worried that the violence, uh, the shelling, the bombardments that we're seeing elsewhere will soon reach that part of the country? Yes, people here are worried. They are scared. Uh, they believe that anything can happen. And we saw just, uh, just a few days ago that uh, Russian forces attacked uh, military infrastructure, uh, training and peacekeeping center not far away from Lviv and only about 20 kilometers away from the Polish border. So people are aware of that. And this night we had to seek shelter. We had an aid air raid alarm twice this night. So people are scared, of course. Now, as we heard in our report just prior to speaking to you, President Zelensky said he believes Russia may now be more open to negotiations, that their position, as he put it, may be more, is more realistic now. Is that overly hopeful, do you think? It could be, but of course that's a message uh, that is uh, needed here in Ukraine uh, in this time of, of uh, suffering and, and desperation. And, and we ha also have to stress that there has been some progress in the talks between the Ukrainian and Russian delegations. We saw that yesterday 2,000 uh, vehicles were able to leave the uh, city of Mariupol, the city that is under siege. So uh, this is really uh, progress uh, taking into account how Desperate the situation there is when we talk about uh, talks about a potential ceasefire. This is a, a long way to go, I would say, and uh, we will see whether uh, the Ukrainian uh, um, government or its delegation will be able to to make any progress on that. Talking to the Russian delegation. Right, DW correspondent Alexander von Naaman, thank you very much. Well, let's turn now to DW's Russia analyst, Roman Gocharenko. He's speaking to us from Bonn. Roman, President Zelensky, as we were just talking about there, discussing with Alexandra, says that Russian demands during the talks are becoming more realistic. Do we know what Russia's position is and whether it has indeed shifted? Well, um, at this moment, uh, we have no details from those negotiations, so we can only speculate and analyse. So what we heard from Russia before or during the previous uh, rounds of negotiations, that Russia insisted, for example, that Ukraine acknowledge Crimea, the annex Crimea, as part of Russia. Russia was also suggesting that Ukraine should acknowledge those um, so-called people's republics in eastern Ukraine of Donetsk and Luhansk as independent states. So we don't hear such demands anymore, and we can assume that maybe Russia has dropped them. Uh, what we've heard, for example, from the Russian representative at the UN um, are the key three demands that Russia is still sticking to, and those are that um, Ukraine should be denazificated. This is how Russia puts it, probably meaning that there are some, uh, some uh, extremists uh, um, at, in power in Ukraine, which is, of course, not the case. Um, Russia also insists on the uh, demilitarizing Ukraine, and this is what we see from the very beginning, Russian uh, army striking military objects Ukraine, but not only military objects, of course. And um, Russia also wants Ukraine uh, to put um, into its constitution to write down uh, the passage mm -hmm. that it will not be uh, part of NATO. And this is what we've heard from the Ukrainian president, uh, that uh, maybe Ukraine is no more uh, pursuing that goal. But he didn't say it quite like that. He said that maybe it will be difficult and uh, that he is disappointed. So I think there is some movement. But in the key question for Ukraine now, uh, which is uh, humanitarian corridors, there has been little progress, some but little. Ukraine claims Russia has been escalating its bombardment of civilian targets. Do you think that's a strategic move? Of course. Of course, it's a strategic move. And I think Russia is trying to terrorize Ukraine, to terrorize Ukrainian population, uh, to force some concessions from the government in Kiev and to force Ukraine um, to, to, to move on some, some key issues for Russia. And of course, uh, the second aim, I think, is to... Um, to uh, move Ukrainians, uh, to, to become refugees, to leave the country, 
to block the roads, to, to mm -hmm. maybe um, create difficulties for you, the Ukrainian army. Mm -hmm. And, and this, is, this is what I think is the goal, but it is not working because the Ukrainian government is still fighting and I think it will not give up. It will not yield to Russian demands. Mm -hmm. And even those terrible uh, airstrikes that we've seen for, for three weeks now, uh, that they will not um, lead for, for, for Ukraine to change its, its position. Roman, we don't have much time left, but I wanted to ask you just domestically what effect this invasion and the international sanctions are having on Russians. Shortly, just one example. Uh, the, the effect of sanctions is really growing day by day. And uh, I hear news that Russians are really worried that they will not be having enough enough. Um, supplies of things for their daily needs. Uh, uh, for example, uh, things like Pampers for kids. Mm -hmm. Russians are trying to, to buy as many as they can, as long as there are some still in Russian shops. So we see uh, spare parts for cars, um, um, some medical equipment, some, some medicine, uh, you, you name it. Um, there is a huge, huge shortage of such things in Russia in the coming days and weeks. I think this is something Russia underestimated. Roman Goncharenko from DW Russian Department, thank you very much for the analysis. Two journalists working for the US network Fox News have been killed in Ukraine. Irish cameraman Pierre Zakrashevsky, seen here at the front of this photo, and Ukrainian producer Alexandra Kuvshinova died when their vehicle, the vehicle they were travelling in, came under fire outside Kyiv. Fox News said another reporter has been hospitalised. At least four journalists have died covering the conflict since it began about three weeks ago. The European Union has imposed a new round of sanctions against Russia aimed at stifling fin financing of its invasion of Ukraine. The measure, measures also hit the inner circle of President Vladimir Putin. DW's Christine Mundwa has more from Brussels. As Russia continues to barrage Ukraine with bombs, the European Union has delivered its latest blow to the Kremlin with a fresh round of sanctions. They're designed to punish Moscow for the death and devastation it has brought on its neighbour. The measures will be felt in Russia by both the ordinary and the elite. They include banning the export of luxury goods to Russia, stopping steel product imports from Russia, freezing the assets of the billionaire oligarch Roman Abramovich and others close to Vladimir Putin, and denying Russia special trading access into the EU market. The EU says this new round of sanctions will put more economic pressure on the Kremlin, further crippling its ability to finance the invasion into Ukraine. But the bloc is still sending hundreds of millions of euros into Russia's coffers every single day. That money is payment for the oil and gas Europe buys from Russia to keep the heating and lights on. Banning Russia's energy would deal a heavy blow to its economy, but it would also hurt ordinary Europeans who are already seeing the cost of their living soar. We have to find a solution how we, as uh, soon as we can, phase out of this uh, fossil fuel deliveries. But for the moment, it is still extremely difficult. But this would make, of course, a huge impact because right now, every day, uh, we transfer seven to 800 million euros um, on the state budget or to the state budget of Russia. Since the end of February, the West has imposed thousands of sanctions on Russia for its aggression towards Ukraine. In just weeks, Russia has overtaken Iran to become the most sanctioned country in the world. It's not clear if this pressure will be enough to force Russia to stop. Now to some other stories making news around the world. Credit rating companies have suggested that Russia may be on the verge of defaulting on its foreign currency debt. That's after international sanctions limited its ability to access foreign exchange reserves. Moscow is due to pay over $117 million in interest on sovereign bonds on Wednesday, with more payments looming later in the month. US President Joe Biden signed a budget bill into law on Tuesday. It includes $13.6 billion in additional military and humanitarian aid to Ukraine. The White House confirmed that Biden will travel to Brussels next week to attend an extraordinary NATO summit to discuss the crisis.
The Council of Europe has voted to expel Russia as a member. The pan-European body has the mission to uphold human rights and the rule of law. The vote came hours after Russia said it was pulling out.